Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is April 1st and we are starting with H203, an act relating to criminal threatening a state employee or elected official. And actually um, Representative Rachelson is one of the, uh, or maybe the lead sponsor. Um, I don't know if, if you wanted to say a few words before we do the walkthrough or I'll just briefly say that um, this pa the, this past uh, year and definitely the past few months, we've seen a lot of um, officials and government workers threatened, um, including in our state. And um, there was one actually, I just sent the chair that was in the newspaper. I forget now which one that was. I think it was maybe Winooski, but, but it's been rather um, a regular occurrence nationally and here in Vermont. And one of the things that seems important is um, us taking a stand that just because somebody is a government worker or an elected official, that sort of over, that crosses the line to be making threats um, of harm, of death to um these people and I'm hoping that it would deter other um, people from from doing such uh, such actions that are not in the spirit of civility or public service. So that's it basically. Great. Well thank you. Appreciate that. And we're now going to turn to uh, attorney Bryn here to help us um, again realize it's a short form, so we're not doing a walkthrough, but but certainly to update us on the on the law. Um, if other states have um, have similar laws, uh, so I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, good morning, committee. For the record, Bryn here from Legislative Council. Um, I thought it might make sense to talk briefly about the existing criminal threatening statute um, for just as a reminder to the committee of what it is, what it says, what it does, um, before talking about this proposal to create an enhanced penalty. Um, so we can, if everybody wants to pull up the statute, or I can just talk about it, or I can share my screen, what would the committee prefer? Folks? Do you have a preference to want to look at it? Want me to just talk about it? I've got it in front of me already, so. Okay. Everybody have it? Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So. So the criminal threatening statute was added about five years ago. Um, and. Is 13 VSA 1702. So um, the, this existing statute provides that a person shall not knowingly threaten another person. Um, and as a result of that threat, place the other person in reasonable apprehension of death or serious bodily injury. Um, so this statute is really designed to reach um, only true threats. Um, and as many members of this committee is aware, um, true threats is a, are a category of speech that is not protected by the First Amendment. Um, and they encompass like those statements that um, are where the speaker means to communicate a serious expression of an intent to commit an unlawful act of violence um, against a particular person or a group of people. Um, so that, that is really uh, the definition of true threats from US Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence. And this statute, the criminal threatening statute is pretty narrowly drawn to only encompass um, true threats. And if you are looking at the statute, you'll see that there's a subsection B is the penalty section. So a person who violates that subsection A um, is subject to a misdemeanor penalty of one year um, imprisonment or a thousand dollar fine or both. And then uh, subsection C provides an enhanced penalty. Um, and this, I think was added probably the, a year after the criminal threatening statute was created. And it creates an enhanced penalty for a person who commits the act of criminal threatening as it's set out in subsection A with some specific intent. And that specific intent is to prohibit or prevent a person, another person from reporting child abuse or neglect um, to the Department for Children and Families. 
So that imposes a heightened penalty of two years or a thousand dollar fine or both. And then uh, subsection D creates the definitions and that's where you define what serious bodily injury means, which is what it means throughout Title 13. And then uh, you also included some language here that says threat or threatened shall not include constitutionally protected activity. So this was, um, this. some of the committee members may remember the discussion about this language. Um, just this was added uh, to make sure that um, the statute was only covering true threats or other um, speech that is not protected by the constitution. Um, and then subsection F or subsection E provides that a person who's under 18 shall be adjudicated as a juvenile delinquent if they're charged under the statute. Um, and then subsection F sets out an affirmative defense that a person can raise if they can prove by a preponderance of the evidence that they didn't have the ability to carry out the threat. Um, so the H203, the short form, um, would create, the short form proposes to create another um, enhanced penalty. So like that enhanced penalty that you see in subsection C for um, an intent to prevent a person from reporting child abuse or neglect, this would be an enhanced penalty um, if the person had the intent to threaten a state employee or an elected official. Um, and the short form statement of purpose doesn't set out what that enhanced penalty would be specifically, but obviously that would be up for up to the committee to, to think about and decide. So um, there are other states uh, that provide for, for um, some, some type of criminal penalty for threatening um, a public official. Um, I thought I would give a couple of examples. <clears throat> One is um, Louisiana has a has a has a separate statute for threatening a public official. Um, so they they have a statute that prohibits threatening a public official um, with serious bodily injury or death, and um, they also have an enhanced provision for if a person threatens a public official uh, with the intent to influence his or her conduct in relation to their official duty or um, with the intent to retaliate against that person for one of their actions um, that were undertaken as a part of their position as a public official. So um, that's one example. There's also, Wisconsin also has um, quite an assortment of criminal threatening statutes and prohibitions. Um, and similarly, they have, they have a provision that a threat to a witness is prohibited. So a witness in some type of contested case um, or judicial proceeding, threats to an officer of the court, threats to law enforcement officers, um, threats to the Department of Revenue employees um, are also specifically prohibited and threats to Department of Public Safety um, or professional services department or workforce development employees. So they get pretty specific with what kind of employees um, they, they are protecting here. Um, so that's just a couple of examples. Um, there's not, it's, the majority of states don't have um, specific protections in place for elected officials or state employees with respect to criminal threatening. Um, but I did, I was able to find a couple of them. So. Um, I'm going to pause there to see if there's some questions for me. Great. Um, I think I have a, um, Tom, I'll get to you in a second. So Bryn, the um, Wisconsin and the other um, states, these are separate laws as opposed to enhanced penalties? Yes, um, they are separate provisions. Um, and Wisconsin actually has a separate provision for each category of employee or protected person um, that they want to prohibit criminal threatening with respect to. So um, they do break it out quite, quite, um, quite liberally there. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tom and then Barbara. Yeah. Uh, morning. I just, I'm just wondering about uh, Louisiana and Wisconsin, how, how long uh, these laws have been in effect, if you knew that. And I guess another question would be, why did they choose to go in this direction? You know, I, that I don't know. I didn't do, um, I didn't do 
sort of comprehensive research about their statutes, it would be, I'm sure it'd be easy for me to find out how long they've been in place. Um, and I can try and find out what their, what their um, motivation was. That would be great. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Barbara. Um, so when I introduced this, I didn't think about town clerks or mayors, and I know that they've been some of the people that actually have been uh, receiving threats and other uh, sort of either retaliation. So I don't know how that would affect um, this if that's something we could do if we take this bill up or, or not. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and then um, Brent, in terms of the other statutes, are they against the actual official or um, are family members included? Uh, so that is, it varies depending on the statute. So um, in, Wisconsin, it does also include family members for certain types of protected uh, officials. Um, I think that it's witnesses and um, actually no, for everybody, everyone in Wisconsin is, uh, it also includes their family members, not just the, pro the protected um, official, but also their family members. And Louisiana only includes the public official and not um, additional members. Okay, thank you. Um, well, Thank you. Um, yeah, just a couple of things. Obviously this is, uh, you know, for me, this is a, a certainly a bill I'm interested in. Uh, last year, my family had to buy a home security system because of uh, threats my wife received in her role as president of the Rutland City School Board. So, I mean, this is something that, that we've thought about. And also quite frankly, um, you know, it can be a little frustrating because the, um, you know, what, what my wife received were threats via text and via email. And there are websites out there which allow people to go on and, and send these messages anonymously and they're very hard to trace. And so, you know, it, it, it also seemed like to some degree, I mean, I understand it's not the easiest task for law enforcement to trace it, but the, there, there seemed to be a, um, time issue it seemed to be like it certainly never seemed like anyone's priority quite frankly and you know maybe with an enhanced penalty that would be a, a little added um, impetus to move things along but um one other thing i wanted to know was in regard to uh something that, that barbara said in regards to um you know intent to threaten a state employee or elected official um thinking back to, to my time in, in local city government i'm not certain anyone quite frankly was more threatened than the building inspector uh, so, um, I would certainly, if we move forward, encourage something that said, you know, threaten a state or municipal employee, because there are people like the city clerk, like the building inspector, like the zoning inspector, who are um, employees of local government, who often take the brunt of people's, people's anger, and that boils over sometimes. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Will. And that made me also think about there are a number of appointed um, officials in addition to elected. So something else to put on the consideration list, uh, Bob. Yes, good morning, Bryn. Uh, I didn't have the number of, of the bill you were quoting. I, I've got the short form bill here to review. What, what was that again? So the short form is uh, H203. Yep. And the other bill you're looking at this morning is H302. Easy to remember, they're opposite <clears throat> of each other. Thank you. And looking at this and listening to many other members of, of the uh, committee here, obviously, uh, as written, this is, is, a, is a wide and could be very encompassing uh, a bill uh, with many different avenues of family members, elected employees. And I'm looking at state employees or elected officials, and I'm looking at state employees, which happen to be, uh, say, uh, Vermont State Police officers, fish and game, so on and so forth. And there's no inclusion in there for I can I can just see the other uh, the sheriffs and municipalities coming forward and say, well, wait a minute, you know, aren't our two cents worth anything here also? I mean, because it's, it's defined as state employees or elected officials. And I don't know, I, I'm looking at, why don't we just have a law, an enhanced law that says no one should be subject to being threatened or versus trying to 
identify school boards and town clerks and mayors and all these things just it's just a thought i mean just just a law in itself it says everyone's included in this no one's no one should not be left out of this right so uh, that's what you that's what you have currently that if there is a prohibition on criminal threats to anybody currently um, and when you when the legislature created the criminal threatening statute, there was some initial conversation about whether or not there should be certain protected categories that were um, subject to a heightened penalty. And the idea didn't didn't take hold um, that year. But I think that there was um, a thought that continuing conversation was needed on on that. Well, it just, it just seems as though, I mean, I know we're all elected officials here with, with a few exceptions, but why would we create something that puts us at a level higher than the, the, than the general, uh, than the general public, so to speak, is I guess what I'm getting to. I like being protected. I'm not concerned about it after dealing with what I have been for a number of years here. But when I look at things, I look at things that are available for all of uh, the members throughout the state of Vermont here. And I'm just wondering why we're looking at a special section to put in this particular case us in that section yeah, yeah i appreciate that certainly certainly a consideration and certainly and we'll hear from the witnesses as, as well i'm sure regarding regarding that uh, let's see um tom felicia will sorry if i'm not getting the order correctly but go ahead tom. Yeah, uh, bob great minds think alike i guess it's exactly what i had on my on my mind is that we have uh you know, we've got a law for that already, uh, you know, from the way I understand it. And, and a little bit that I've heard so far is that there's uh, some impression that an enhanced penalty uh, will, you know, even for a special category, I guess, will maybe thwart uh, what's going on. And, uh, you know, to me, if we were going to go in this direction, instead of making new laws, uh, if an enhanced penalty is, you know, is potential. I don't think it's going to, but if it's going to potentially be a uh, discourage people from doing it, then um, just enhance the penalty and, and, and everybody's covered that way. Okay, again, more questions for, for Bryn. Um, we're getting into committee discussion a little bit about policy, which is, which is fine, but um, we also have witnesses here, so questions for Bryn regarding the, the law. Um, oh, I'm losing my order here. Let's see. <laughs> Everybody's popping up. So Felicia, Coach, Martin, and I'm sorry if I'm going out of order of when you raised your hands, but go ahead. Yeah, so I guess my point was more committee discussion, so I'll keep it very brief. But to, to Ken and Tom's point, there is absolutely the perception that some of the harassment and some of the threats that we receive, we signed up or an elected official signed up to work for the public. And so we have to take it. And I don't think that that is on par with a neighborly dispute that might get into criminal threatening or you know, a feud of some kind. I think that there's very different classes of behavior because the average person isn't writing their neighbor hate mail on a weekly basis and sending it around. It's not that way. And just to put a slightly finer point on it, my partner runs a newspaper. He gets his fair share of hate and discontent and occasionally death threats. But when he calls local law enforcement to say, hey, I've received this, just wanted to let you know about it. They kind of add it to his file and they ask him, do you want um, a no trespass order for this person? Do you want a no contact? What would you like to prevent this from happening? And when I receive the same, it's okay. Well, if that rises to a different level, you can absolutely contact state police. And when my house was shot at this summer, it was state police came up and they took a record of it, but well, you're a public official and people feel entitled to tell you how they feel. And there's, there's a point that people are crossing the line and we're seeing that increasingly with tensions rising around politics, that people's opinions aren't opinions, they're threats in some cases. And I think that this 
looks to put a finer point on that because it wasn't just me receiving threats. There was people who had children at home and were at work, legislators who they had protesters out front of their house. And that can be incredibly scary and it can drive people out of public service as we have seen. And I think that's why we, we look at creating a different class if we were, because there is a very different set of access and responsibility and, and, and the public knows that. And that's, I think what we're seeing. So that's, it's just my two cents. Sorry for the committee discussion, Madam Chair. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and um, Bryn, in terms of the um, case law or have you, I, ma I imagine that's been discussed, right? Yes, so, so uh, you know, I think I'm hearing Representative Leffler's um, sort of anecdotes about the kinds of threats that she's received. And I, that, th that wouldn't be qualify as like political hyperbole. There is a category of speech that is um, protected the United States Supreme Court um, talked about this kind of uh, political speech in Watts versus the United States. Um, some of you might remember that was a case from the 60s when um, uh, a person was charged with threatening um, the president because he made a statement at a public rally that if he was um, drafted to fight in Vietnam, that he the first person he would set in his sights was LBJ. Um, and the court talked about that as being political hyperbole. That wasn't a specific um, threat to the president. And the I can give you a little quote from the from the court. They said debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. Um, but that. That kind of language is protected, but that true threats language, if the language is um, intended to place the target in fear, um, then that is not protected speech under uh, political hyperbole. So um, I, I think that I just want to make it clear to the committee that threats to public officials, threats that are that you're receiving that place you in fear, um, if the if the person intended to place you in fear, that is a that is a true threat if it's motivated by political animus or not. Thank you. Uh, Coach Martin Barbara. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, sorry, I had two of me going there. Uh, had some problems with connectivity. Um, but uh, I'd just like to say that uh, Will's comments um, earlier uh, and Felicia's uh, speak directly you know, to um, the reality of what's going on. Um, and uh, I don't think that they're, you know, just by having the general uh, that uh, the people um, will respond um, the way that we would hope. Um, and so, you know, what, I, what I've seen over time, and I think we've all seen it, is members of the body, you know, being threatened. You know, I mean, directly threatened, not in, um, you know, a casual way uh, or political hyperbole. You know, when people come into your house or in, on your property, that's different you know, than just, you know, having, uh, you know, sending an email or whatever, you know, I got three of them, you know, like yesterday, you know, so it's like, and please don't tell me that's what I signed up for. <laughs> you know, I didn't sign up for people being uh, uh, disrespectful. You know, I treat everybody with respect and I expect you know, that in return, you know, I, I understand that we're in a very volatile time, but that still does not change, you know, the, uh, the expectation, you know, uh, discourse is discourse and conversation is conversation, 
but when when people go to the lengths that you know Felicia was talking about and will um, you know to my fellow you know colleagues that are trying to do this work of service uh, that's over the edge you know that's crossing the line and and I think that this will hopefully uh, when we hear from our our witnesses, especially the state's attorneys, who actually have the discretion to work with uh, more intentional uh, language, especially if we enact something to this regard, then that's where the change is going to occur. You know, you prosecute a few of these folks that thought they would do what they used to do and that will change behavior uh, but i just wanted to uh, thank uh, will and felicia for their their comments thank you thank you coach uh let's see martin and then barbara so um i do have a question for bryn but I'm going to jump in and throw my two cents worth in as well, since everybody else, before I get to my question. Um, so my, my view, I mean, if we start, if we start having enhancements for one particular class of people, we're just going to be going down. We may as well start putting teachers in there, uh, medical profession, you know, we can, you know, once you start down that road, as we've seen in other places where we've done enhancements, we keep on having people say, well, why not me? Um, and the, we're, we're really, th this is an interesting area because of course the, the uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence on, on First Amendment law really restricts what we can do here. Um, and, and I guess one other point is that, you know, enhancing the penalty is gonna do nothing, frankly, and I'm sure we'll hear from Marshall to this extent. Uh, enhancing a penalty is not something that really affects behavior. Uh, it, it's an enforcement. And that's where I'm going to get to a question in, this, in just a second. But I guess the question I have for Bryn, it's not one I'm expecting you to give it as an answer right at this moment, but it's something a little broader is, you know, where else, you know, looking at what other states have done, look at looking at the latest jurisprudence over this area, are there any other ways that we can strengthen this uh, area of law of, of criminal threatening. I, I tend to doubt that because we've been looking at this for a while, but it, it's worth a look and that's a little bit broader and it's not something that can be done in the near term, I wouldn't think. Maybe this is a, an interim, you know, something for an intern or whatever, or maybe you already know, uh, Bryn, if there are other areas uh, of being able to strengthen this. That's one question. And the other point I'm gonna make, and I don't know if this is, as, this may be a question for Bryn as well, uh, looking beyond just this enhancement, is there, uh, it, should we be looking at what, what gov, GovOps can do as far as training or as far as giving law enforcement the tools they need to be able to identify, you know, the wills issue as far as trying to in, improve enforcement, in other words, as opposed to just an enhancement. And, and that's another question I have as far as, you know, maybe there's something out there that we can do that really gets to the issue, which is identifying who is actually sending these anonymous threats. Uh, so I had a lot of questions there, uh, Brent, if you <laughs> want to respond. Yeah, you know, you, you summarized it pretty well. You've been looking at these issues year after year, really. Um, ways to strengthen these types of threatening uh, behavior, ways to strengthen the penalties or um, the prohibitions on these types of threatening behaviors. Um, you have discussed in the past uh, the enforcement question. Um, there, there, you have heard testimony in the past that there may be uneven enforcement of these pro of the criminal threatening prohibition across the state. Um, you know, I think the GovOps committee has heard testimony to that effect as well. Um, and with respect to your question about how to how to strengthen the criminal threatening provision, um, you know, I think that your your goal with the criminal threatening statute was to only um, prohibit the kind of speech that is not protected by the Constitution, and and you've done that pretty carefully and clearly. Um, when we look at H302, I think that expands it a little bit in a way that I believe is constitutionally permissible. 
um, to prohibit threats against a person's family. Because really what is, true threats are threats that are intended to terrorize a person. Um, so, so it may be that um, a person is receiving a threat against uh, a member of their household and not personally against them. And, um, and as long as that person is reasonably placed in terror, um, then that, that is true threats territory there. So uh, I, I, I think H302 does expand it a little bit, um, strengthen a little, strengthen the, the prohibition a little bit. Um, but I'm sure you'll hear from, hear from other witnesses about that question too. Can I just have one follow-up question when I get a chance? Because I, I had one more question I forgot to ask. Um, yeah, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna go first. <laughs> um, so, Bryn, can you tell us more about um, intent? You've talked about intended to terrorize, or um, and I'm you know looking at the language of um, you know knowingly. What can you speak to us about what what a court would look to in, in terms of intent here? Right. So. Um, the way that you have established the mens rea in criminal threatening is to use the, the mens rea of knowingly, um, which is when a person is aware um, that it's practically certain that their conduct is going to cause a certain result. It's practically certain that the conduct will cause the person to be in fear of serious bodily injury or death. Um, and we talked about this before that there is a requirement, there's a constitutional requirement that the speaker have intended to place the person in fear. Um, and that is um, to avoid like chilling legitimately protected speech. So I think that it was, um, I'm, I may be forgetting which the US Supreme Court decision talked about this. I believe it was the Alonis decision. Um, but the court there provided that by requiring the speaker to intend to scare um, his or her targets, the law would guard the speech of those individuals who mean no harm. So there is an intent element that's required. Um, there's a, there um, is a split in the, way, in the way states handle this intent element. Um, it's, it ha what Alonis made clear is that it has to be um, that recklessly, it has to be some, somewhere above uh, reckless. So um, it's the Supreme Court hasn't made it totally thoroughly clear if it has to be um, what, what the mens rea element has to be, but we know that it has to be above recklessly. So that's why um, the legislature went with knowingly when it was deciding what kind of intent element to place in the statute. Okay. Thank you. So Martin, for your follow-up. Actually, my question was on H302 and we haven't had even the walkthrough of 302 yet. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold mine. Okay. I know I'm thinking that I wonder if I, I'm, maybe I could have done this differently because they're, they're really, we're looking at the same, the same statute, but anyway, sorry. Um, okay. Barbara. I, I want to just amend my answer to that last question just for a moment, if I may. Um, there really is a split in the federal circuits about whether um, about what level of intent is required. Um, so that's why I'm sort of relying on aloneness at this point. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and hopefully our witnesses will, will speak to that as well. Um, okay, so Barbara, Selena, Coach, I see your hand up. I'm not sure if it's from before, but Barbara, Selena, and possibly Coach. Um, so a couple of things. I think Martin makes a good point and wonder about a separate law maybe, and maybe one there, I think there was a law that we passed that um, when child abuse investigators were getting um, threatened a lot, because I remember at my organization, how excited they were. And we put a sign up that said something about um, whatever the wording was, but you're like, you're not allowed to, it's against the law to threaten. And people felt really good about even the signage. Um, obviously you're not gonna put that up at your house. I also wanna remind people that I think it has an effect on people running. I mean, we lost a committee mate who couldn't take the, I mean, it, it got to her and her family was unsafe. Um, so I don't think it's about so much protecting ourselves as it is about uh, not having it be what people sign up for. The last thing that I wanna say is 
yesterday, um, one of our witnesses talked about a neighbor calling um, in a threat or, or a concern. And the police, I don't know who shared it, but obviously the person who called it in then got um, the, the, the whole ire of the person for calling it in. So I don't know what confidentiality there is about um, reporting, because um, that was really, I keep thinking about that yesterday, like that made matters worse. So as we think about this stuff, um, I would hate to have an unintended consequence. Thank you, thank you, okay. Uh, and then Coach. Hi, sorry, taking a minute. Um, I just wanna know, I wasn't sure if I should speak up now or later, but I, I share some of the questions and concerns that folks have raised about um, like creating enhancements. I know there's enhancements for, uh, um, you know, DC in certain kinds of DCF case threatening. Um, but I share some of the current concerns folks have raised around creating an enhancement just for elected officials. Um, I think that might be, well, we, we know that we're in a moment where, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of threats um, directed at BIPOC folks, at Asian Americans in our community. And um, I just I just worry about sort of being like, I, I think it could be a really hard read to pass something on its face that just addressed elected officials when many members of that community would like all editorialize and say rightly, you know, think probably we haven't done enough to, um, offer protection and support. Um, and so I share those concerns that folks have raised. And I also note that when those identities intersect, um, it's, it's particularly, has, has clearly been particularly hard for folks of color to serve in elected office in our state. And, um, you know, like, we used to have a colleague with us on this committee whose wisdom I really miss uh, in partnership. And I know that at times the interpretation of the law has been um, kind of like what Felicia described experiencing, like, well, you're an elected official, so you're actually less protected. And I just wonder, Bryn, if you could speak to that latter point and like how, if there's something if there's a way of approaching that interpretation. Oh. Thank you. So Representative Colburn for the, I understand the question. Um, and I, I just would reiterate what I said earlier, which is that um, I do not believe that it's true that you're less protected um, by the statute because you're an elected official. And this is where it might get to that enforcement question um, because the criminal threatening statute applies to everyone. And, um, and and I, you know, talked a little bit earlier about that kind of speech that is protected, that political hyperbole speech. Um, but that that is a category of speech that does not include what is um, prohibited by the criminal threatening statute. So, um, so I I read the statute as being quite clear that it applies to public officials. You're no um, less subject to protection because you're a public official. Um, it's. I, I think that maybe there is the, maybe enforcement, law enforcement may have some question about what, um, what, the, what the speech looks like. Um, but again, if, it, if, if the speech falls within the, within the statute, then it is a true threat and it is not um, protected speech. What's up? Thank you. Great. Uh, Coach. Um, you know, after, after hearing the, uh, the continued questions, um, I, I went back to, uh, a 
session that we were having uh, with the uh, the prosecutors. And part of the discussion was around prosecutorial discretion. And I think that gets to what Tom and and uh, Bob were talking about as far as within the general category, you know, of criminal threatening. If we're very, very clear about that fear uh, and fear of bodily harm or fear of uh, injury to family, it doesn't matter which category it is. You know, fear is fear. If if someone places any individual, like the you know the existing uh, you know statute reads, then that falls within that category. Um, what came out of that that meeting? Because I, I went back to you know my my notes, and uh, uh, one of the witnesses is here today, and I'll raise that uh, that question uh, with him. Uh, when when he's uh, testifying, uh, but it was around uh, their ability to at least bring charges or a claim of a charge, you know, against you know that defendant, you know, who perpetrated, you know, you know the. Uh, uh, the resulting crime that we're talking about now by uh, creating a, a, a maybe a more intense uh, version of um, you know our our statute as it exists but that's um, and then that also includes uh, what Martin was talking about as far as the training you know piece you know if it's a clear understanding that this is unacceptable so it isn't a question of, you know, one person thinks, you know, one law enforcement officer or one prosecutor thinks that, well, this is kind of almost there. No, uh, it is, it is or it isn't. And and I think that's where that uh, training and clarity really could be helpful, you know. I think, uh, and maybe that's something that. You know, I'm not sure how you'd do that, Bryn, you know, with, with language, uh, but uh, it, it just raises, you know, an interesting uh, theorem. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. Um, so, so Bryn, I guess, lower my hand here, it, no better way to put it for me anyway, it, I, no matter what we what we put into law is is criminal threatening plain and simple just criminal threatening regardless of uh, special interest groups or penalties uh or or anything uh, i mean even if we tr try to redefine criminal threatening there there's I'm going to guess that there's already a standard in you know in courts higher than than we are um that have defined it Yep, that's the true. That's the true threats doctrine. Um, that's the category of speech that the criminal threatening statute deals with. Uh, that is speech that is not protected by the First Amendment. Okay, so the, the only thing we can really do then is to uh, potentially create. Uh, this is a question. <laughs> um, potentially create a special interest group with an enhanced penalty. <clears throat> well, so. You, you've done, the legislature has done this before in, um, in different types of statutes. For example, there's an enhanced penalty for assaulting certain kinds of professionals like uh, um, EMTs and firefighters. And I think there's some others, DCF workers. Um, so I think that it's really, it's a question of whether you see certain types of conduct as being worthy of a, of a, a greater penalty than other types of conduct. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have. I mean, it's it's nothing to you, I know, but I have a just have a, a 
on this one, an issue with creating this special interest group. And um, I mean, after a while, I mean, with, with all these uh, um, enhancements for special interest groups, we're just bringing more and more and more people into the fold. And, and, you know, John Q public is, uh, is going to be left out. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess I would go back to, we, we have a lot of cover it. And if we feel the need to, uh, enhance the penalties for for the public and put everybody on a par um, would would make sense to me because I, I I understand you know you know there's certain things we sign up for and, and not sign up for and um, you know that type of thing but um, why should to me why should I have a special uh, category for myself because somebody threatens me over a political thing um, you know, why should I be considered special when, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to our testimony yesterday when, um, you know, people were threatened down in Bennington and, uh, and, and potentially, you know, the same type of threat, the same type of fear that's involved and the same feelings and, and, uh, and they don't, um, get the, the considerations that I would. Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you, Tom. Barbara. Okay. Sorry, I'll be quick. Um, so when Tom was saying that, what occurred to me is it could interfere with um, people doing their jobs. For example, if you get threatened very much about a position you have, you might choose not to vote that way or not show up for the vote or, and I'm just thinking about other people doing their job. So it's not that we're above the people. I, and again, it's bigger than us, you know, like it was somebody who recently threatened the commissioner of agriculture, um, a couple of weeks ago, like, like, I don't know. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, Will, and then Felicia. I'll, I'll be very quick, but I wanted to to address the the question, you know, sort of close to when Tom raised it. And um, you know, one point I just wanted to make is, you know, you're talking about secluding uh, John Q. Public from from this group, the group of elected officials. But any member of the public can become an elected official. And and why I think this this discussion has merit, and considering this enhanced penalty or some other way to address this has merit, is because threats, people sending these threats are in effect having a negative consequences on who runs for office. I'm not gonna put anyone on the spot. I can name four people in Rutland City who chose not to run for public office because my wife was threatened, who said, I have kids, I can't put myself out there like that. These sort of attacks on public officials, these sort of threats directed at public officials are shaping our discourse because they are not just potentially affecting the decisions of the officials who are threatened, but they are also convincing other people who want to serve their communities that it's not safe for them to do so. Thank you. Okay, Felicia, and then I'm gonna turn back to Bryn and then we'll take a break. Go ahead, Felicia. Yeah, it, I just, I kind of wanted to respond to some of the comments and, and just in, in discourse, it's not elevating an elected official of any level above a member of the public. The public has a very different role than we have. And when threatening behavior not dealt with, when credible threats, not political speech, not hyperbole, when it's not dealt with, it impacts the votes you're able to take. You feel safe taking it impacts who runs, who resigns. When I was looking to get into politics, one of the first stories I saw was Kai Mortz uh, resigning. And we've seen that trend continue where people feel so harassed and so unprotected as officials, as leaders in their community, that they don't even bother staying in the state, let alone staying in that position. And it's not elevating 
our positions or other elected officials positions over that of the public, it is protecting our ability to do our job for our constituents. I represent 4000 disparate voices. And I should be able to do that without being the focal point of a lot of hate and direct threats. I have a thick skin. I, I can take that, that annoyed, that frustrated. But when it rises to that level, we have to do something about that. And whether it's enforcement, whether it's a heightened penalty, I just, I don't think that we can push it off as, well, we don't want to make ourselves a special class because it's not about us right now. It's who's doing this job in the future. So that's just my two cents. Okay, thank you. I was gonna to turn to Bryn, but then Tom, your, <laughs> your hand went up. So <laughs> yeah, just, just real quick and, and then I'll be done for now, I guess, is that uh, um, I can be threatened. I haven't been, uh, uh, I can be. Uh, you know, threatened, you know, maybe with physical harm, uh, you know, with, with death or whatever. And my neighbor can too. You know, my neighbor that's not in, uh, you know, in, in the public eye can be threatened too. And, and, and I guess why shouldn't he, he, he she, they uh, have the same considerations and the same protections as I would have. And I'm not, you know, and then we, we eliminate any potential uh, uh, look of having elevated ourselves or, um, you know, creating another special interest group and in protect all Vermonters. Okay, well, well, thank you. And I, I certainly have let this discussion go on um, longer than, than we usually do, but it, it, it felt important <laughs> to, uh, to give committee members the, um, the space to do this. And I think hopefully our, our witnesses will find it helpful when they when they do testify to some of the policy considerations um, that we are that we are looking at. Um, so before our break, Bryn, if you could um, please just walk us through 302, and maybe I should have done that one one first, but um, I think it just might be helpful to for us to look at that, and then the witnesses can either. Um, do the bill separately or or together because they we're really in the same section. So sure, yeah, thank you. Um, if I might just respond to um, one of Representative Rachelson's points um, sure. that there, I just wanted to point out we there is also a felony prohibition on hindering a public official um, or a public officer, and that's thirteen VSA three thousand and one. Um, that statute provides that if a, if a person impedes a public officer um, and that requires that they actually impede the public officer, um, the performance of their duties, whether they actually make the performance of their duties interfere with the performance of their duties, um, then that, that is a felony. So that may also be a, a statute the committee wants to look at. Um, so, <clears throat> um, I'll jump to 302 now, if that's all right. Um, and would the committee like me to put it up on the screen or does everybody have it available there? Everyone has it? Okay. Yeah, I think, I think we have it, yeah, thank you. So I already kind of walked through the existing criminal threatening statute. So I feel like this is gonna be, um, this won't, won't take too long. This bill really um, changes the criminal threatening statute in three ways. Um, first, it expands the existing criminal threatening prohibition to apply if uh, the speaker threatens the listener's family, um, as we discussed before. I talked about that a little bit before. Um, so that's at the bottom of page one. So the person would have to knowingly um, place the other person in reasonable apprehension of death or serious bodily injury to the, the listener or to the listener's family. And I wanted to point out that in the bill, um, family is not defined. And if you do want to um, work on this draft, I would recommend defining what family means. And one um, suggestion might be to use the household members definition that you use in Title 15, um, abuse prevention chapter. So you encompass um, individuals who, who uh, are a part of the household. So I just want to point that out. The second thing that the bill does is if you scroll down to page two, it adds an enhanced penalty to the criminal, um, as you've been discussing, adds an enhanced penalty 
for violating the statute by threatening to use a firearm or an explosive device at a school, um, on school grounds, in a school building, uh, at an institution of higher education. So it bumps the uh, penalty from one year to five years um, with a $5,000 fine or both. Um, so we've been talking a lot about enhanced penalties this morning, so I imagine that um, doesn't need a lot more explanation. And then the last change that the bill makes is down at the bottom of page two in subdivision F. Um, I re referenced earlier that this subdivision provides an affirmative defense um, that a defendant can raise to a charge under the section that they didn't have the ability to carry out the threat. So what this would do is it would um, instead make the fact that the defendant didn't have the ability to carry out the threat rather than removing criminal liability for that, um, if the person was able to successfully uh, introduce that evidence um, as an affirmative defense, it would instead make it a mitigating factor at sentencing. So essentially what, what that change, um, effectively that change would really say, this doesn't remove criminal liability, but it does, um, it, it does um, maybe require a little bit less of a penalty if the person didn't have the ability to carry out the threat. Um, and that, that's it. Those are the changes made by H302. Great. Thank you, Bryn. On line 18 in, um, in F, should that be the word that, should that be struck out as well? Yep, it should. Little <laughs> okay. typo there. Thank you. Good catch. Great. Thanks. So, okay. Any questions about the language in 302 before we take a break? Okay, All right, great, thank you. So uh, let's take a 15 minute break, please. And I'll uh, be back here.